a very successful. Oh. <laughs> Got it. Okay. We had a very successful year in 2020, and uh, we are starting with a phenomenal uh, book and a fantastic writer uh, this year also. And um, as you guys know, I'm Pinky Shah from Ken Memorial Library. I'll be your host for tonight, uh, along with uh, Sabina. Uh, and just uh, uh, I again, to just to throw a reminder out, uh, please mute yourself so uh, we have a, a clean uh, talk. And we'll have, this is an interactive, um, um, program so I, I, after half an hour or so once i'm done you guys will i'll let you guys open to the floor and you can ask questions if you want to raise your hand or, or write your question in the chat and i'll be more than happy to ask for you and just as again as a reminder this event will be recording and now i would love to uh, read a little bit about uh, Alison larkin um she is the internationally best-selling author of the novels stay why can i be be you and swimming for sunlight her short fiction has been published in the somerset review and slice and non-fiction in the anthologies i'm not the biggest bitch in this relationship and author in progress uh, she lives in the san francisco bay, bay area with her husband jeremy and their rescue dog roxy um, uh, welcome, uh, Allison, to our program, and thank you so much uh, for joining us all the way from the other side of the country. <laughs> um, thank you. Okay. I'm so happy to talk with you. Yes, we are so excited. Uh, and before we jump into the discussion uh, about your book, would you be able to share a little bit about your background and how you were inspired to become a writer? Um, you know, I I was always a reader. I you know, I loved my summer reading program at the library that I went to as a kid. I always read as many books as I could get my hands on. Um, but I had undiagnosed attention deficit disorder as a kid, and I didn't realize that I could be a writer. Uh, when I tried to write as a child, my thoughts always came out in, in kind of a scrambled way. I couldn't really get from beginning to end, and my handwriting was a disaster. And I'd always end up with like eraser marks on my paper and arrows everywhere. And it wasn't until I like, got older and understood that that I could capture my thoughts differently that I was able to write. So I didn't actually start writing until my 20s. Um, I found out I had attention deficit disorder in college and that kind of threw me for a loop and I ended up dropping out of school for a while. Um, I'm sorry, my speaking of rescue dogs, mine is crying and I'm just gonna let her in because then she'll be quiet. <laughs> so, so sorry. <laughs> okay. I think that should be better for everybody. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so 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 that kind of threw me for a loop and it took me a while and it wasn't until I went back to school um, that I I started realizing that I could write and learning how to draft, you know, like writing in drafts wasn't something that I learned uh, in grade school. And so it, it really made a big difference to to think about a piece as a movable object for a while um, to think about you know, a work is an evolving thing. It's not the first thought that you put down and it's okay if that's messy. Um, there's a really great book by Anne Lamott called Bird by Bird that's about writing. That's really amazing. And she she talks a lot about your messy first drafts and um, that kind of opened up everything for me to realize that, that it was about collecting my thoughts and refining them. And so now like in, in this book, because I think you've you've all read this book and that's why you're here um the the scene where april leaves the sweater behind in the hotel is actually the first scene i ever wrote of april um which is pretty far into the book yeah and then i kept asking myself questions and got to the beginning um eventually after i wrote quite a bit of the the last part of the book i kind of got back to the beginning and i think um you know, I couldn't have done that before I realized that you don't have to write in order. You don't have to think in order. And that writing is kind of a discovery process to figure out what the story is instead of knowing what the story is and then sitting down to write it. Wow. wow. So I, I, it sounds like writing came to the rescue for you. Kind of you found your uh, passion. Uh, so. Yeah. I was dancing around it. I, I went to school as a theater major and I really, um, I was kind of shy and, and kind of the most reluctant theater major the world has ever seen. 
but uh, I loved the character study of my acting class so much. I think I loved characters and story and the opportunity to like play inside them so much. And I just hadn't found the right medium yet. And it wasn't until everything came together that like my life started to make sense to me. Mm. Yeah, wow. Um, and um, I must admit that the people we keep, the title, it, it, I love it because it, uh, uh, that is something, you know, like, I feel like it's like a chosen family kind of stuff. You know, we go along yeah. our life and we keep the people I and mean, we create our family. And it's exactly what she did in the, throughout her journey and in your book. Um, and uh, do you, well, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the title? This was your first choice or you had other contender? <laughs> Um, it's really interesting because for a very long time, the title of this book was Mayflower uh, because April was actually born in May. Bodhi has that whole joke about um, Mayflowers and pilgrims and he calls her pilgrim and, um, and, and draws that tattoo for her that Carly gets. And there's this whole concept of the good things that happen after a storm. And but but the problem with Mayflower is that everyone's going to automatically think of pilgrims and think that this is a a book about that instead of um you know that it's it's a deeper historical fiction than the 90s um so we we really worked with the title for a long time and came up with like bob dylan songs and you know all these different things at one point it was called if you see her say hello um we we really struggled with it and then uh the publisher at gallery came up with that title and it took me a minute to kind of get used to it and then it is it is actually the perfect title it it is exactly what the book's about it comes from lines at the end of the book it also is kind of the good thing that comes after a storm is the people you know for april like at the end that is the good after the storm of the life like of her life so far so like the people we keep are the mayflower you know in her life to some extent and um mm -hmm. And it just, you know, it holds true for me and I think it holds true for the story and, and I'm so grateful because it's a great title. Yeah, um, yeah. No, and I, I think it holds true for all of us. I think in our, throughout yeah. our journey, you know, we meet so many different people. Some leave some impression and some we just hang on to. Uh, and that's, uh, so I, I just wanted to let you know that I love the title. Um, Thank you. Been, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, and um, it was so funny, um, after a, one of the patrons, a couple of the patrons actually read this book and they loved it. Um, so they said, do you have any other book by her? And by then I uh, admit I did not, ha I had not done my research. So I just looked in my catalog and I was like, oh no, no, we don't have it. Nobody has it. I'm sorry. <laughs> And then, then once I did my uh, research, I realized all your books were <coughs> under Ellie Perkin. And, yes. and we happen to have a, a Swimming in Sunlight in her library. <laughs> oh my goodness. So what is the story behind you publishing under uh, all those books under Ellie Larkin and then you chose to go with your real name? Yeah, um, you know, my first three books kind of fit a romantic comedy plot a little bit more. And um, and I, I had gone out into the world as Ellie Larkin and um, I felt that it fit and I was happy with it. And then um, the, sorry, I have <coughs> a tickle in my throat. Um, so, uh but i fought for this book for so long because it doesn't really fit the mold of my first three books i think that the heart is really the same but that the um just the the tone is different like maybe the the complexity of it is different to some extent so i i really had a hard time getting people on board with me doing something completely different for such a long time and uh, i'm on my fifth literary agent i'm on my fourth publisher um, it's really been a journey for me in publishing. And most of this has been because I've been fighting for this book because I had this idea of what this book wanted to, what it needed to be, like what April's story was. And then it, um, it really, I didn't want to compromise on it. And the feedback I kept getting about it was that, uh, was about how to make it fit into the box of, mm -hmm 
you know, what my first books had been. And like, at one point there, there was like um, a suggestion that, that Bodhi from the coffee shop should be her romantic interest and come back in the end. And it would have this like happy romantic ending with a 19 year old teenager who just had a baby and now she's gonna fall in love with the guy from the coffee shop, you know? But that was like a suggestion that would make it fit with my other books. And so changing my name gave me the freedom, even though it's the same me, um, just to kind of rebrand and say, this is something different. Um, and I was, I was kind of happy to do that, even though I love my Ellie Larkin books too. It's just, it's easier to think about it as a different thing. Yeah. So it sounds like, so did you have, because the book, the way it turned out, it's amazing. And the ending, you. you just tell me, I, I don't know how that would have uh, <laughs> deal with the readers. Yeah. But do you really, did you, uh, how long did it take you to write this book? Did you have to really fight for it? Like you said, this is yes. the original thing. I'm going to stick with it kind of. Yeah, I started writing this book in 2006 oh. um, when I was still working on my first book, Stay. Uh, before I'd sold it and and before it was done, I, I was working on pages for stay for my writing group. And then um, April just kind of popped into my head and I, I wrote a little bit of her and put it aside. And I had thought it was going to be my second book. And um, my agent at the time, you know, had signed me on this romantic comedy about a woman who accidentally buys a dog off the internet from Slovakia. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was, it was like, she didn't really know what to do with April. It wasn't really her thing, which is fine. So then I went to another agent and, you know, I got more feedback and um, a lot of it was just getting to the point of realizing that like, I, this is the book that I needed to write the most. This is the book that like, just, I had such a clear vision for it. And, um, and I, a lot of times got close to, you know, someone had feedback of like, well, this would be great, but what if she stayed in the same place and had friends her own age? You know, like I was getting feedback like that, that was like, basically like, this is a really great dog that you gave us, but we want a cat, you know? Like, and and so I had to decide that I didn't want to try to make a cat out of it. Like I really wanted to just write it because I needed to. And, um, and because I stuck with it, then eventually I found the people who saw the vision that I had and that really made absolutely all the difference so. and uh, uh, again according to our research this is is this one of the best uh is this is this book getting really the love you um, right it is I think it's yeah very good and I think you. when you stuck with your gut and that's when it happened so I think so yeah yeah and it's interesting because um stay was also you know, it was a book I, I was just on a journey with by myself and I, I didn't really know if anyone was ever going to read it. It was like, you know, I hadn't been published before. I didn't know if I could make it happen. So I really did write it for myself. And I really kind of had to go on this whole journey of like what the industry is and then realize that like I'm at my best when I'm writing for myself. You know, like I think the mo more specific you get about characters and experience, the the better your story is and the more people can relate to it you know so and I, I, I think, think that's what it was about this book I think the character development uh, was so nice that I was actually uh, I was telling Sabina that I I now I can go I can picture the coffee shop in Itika I hope it exists <laughs> <laughs> it did it actually <laughs> did yeah it's not there anymore it's um it's a it's a restaurant called waffle frolic now but it did actually exist I did not work there um but when I was in college at Ithaca I I went there all the time and it was kind of my first chance to be out in the world by myself and like you know be able to get around easily and um I went there all the time and it just felt so special to me um no, I definitely lived uh, April's life uh, through your book for sure. So it was very- Thank you. Yeah. But again, April was, the book starts in 1994, her being 16, correct? Yeah. Uh, and so it's a whole book is uh, uh, told from the voice of teenager because the, it ends in 97 when she's 19 having a baby. So she's still t a teenager. How did you get into the mind of a teenager? Um, I think maybe I never left the mind of a teenager. <laughs> I think I've kind of always held my, my young self in there. I think that's actually, um, 
a little bit common with people with attention deficit disorder. Uh, you know, like we we do have a, a certain amount of presence in our thoughts and voice. Like like it's it's hard to think long term sometimes. Um, I I think I think I just kind of like like tapped into it. I think I, I do have um, a little bit of a youthful perspective still, even though I'm almost forty five. Um, but I I think. I think I also just saw her so clearly that um, it becomes an exercise in perspective. It becomes a, you know, I aged so much in the process of like 15 years is a long time in somebody's life too. So I had her perspective and then I also had the ability to like play with that, to realize there's things she could observe that the reader could see that are gonna be different than what she can actually understand um and and what she's going to admit to herself when she has mo like so it it i think it really became an exercise like it it became a practice and i really enjoyed getting to play with that perspective and then and then having my life change and look at like the ages of the characters that she meets and when i actually was that age i would think like oh that's really interesting like oh here's how margot must have felt about this adorable little girl you know like i guess because all of a sudden i see a kid that age and think like oh man she's got so much promise and i hope she's being well taken care of and i want to be nice to her like i you know you want to encourage these promising young women and i feel like that and um you know if you do the math on all of it i'm actually margot's age now pretty much so um it's kind of interesting to look at it that way yeah. um, I, I picture Margot a little older, but so and it's hard to picture you as a uh, <laughs> mom. <laughs> it's interesting though, because um, if you think about it, like her April's parents were kind of young and April, you know, her dad was probably a little bit older than her mom, but but April's mom was pretty young and um, Margot dated April's dad in high school. So yeah. Yeah. if you do the math, like I, re I remember doing the math on it at some point and being like, Huh. Oh yeah, she would be a grown up to April, but, <laughs> but yeah. she, she seems quite young to me actually. <laughs> so very interesting. Um, but the feeling while I was reading, and I am, I have to admit, I'm a very slow reader. And one benefit of that is I actually get to digest the book and li live into the world that the author creates. So I definitely dive into April's world while I was reading the book. And what I, the feeling I got from April that she felt abandoned uh, by her parents at young age and the hurt she felt she was never able to express because nobody actually, you know, besides Margot, she was not, not, not welcomed um, with anybody. And when she started her own journey, she would leave people who were actually good to her um like um uh, why am i forgetting the character's name the the first boyfriend at itika uh rob no not Robert. oh adam adam, adam. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so he was he was he was really nice to her um and she ended up leaving him because she thought the lie would come out and it would hurt him um and is that what you had in your mind? Like she would leave people before she actually gets hurt or hurt them. Uh, and she kept le leaving people, even though yeah. they were to her. So the, the way the book actually started, I was writing pages for Stay. And um, I heard, I had like my Apple playlist going and I heard um, a Dar Williams song and Dar Williams is a folk singer. So I was like thinking about folk singer life all of a sudden. And, and then there was a water boy song called This is the Sea. And the words are these things you keep, you better throw them away. Um, you better turn your back on your soulless days. It talks about like being tethered and now you're free. And then it's that was the river and this is the sea. And so so that's why like her hometown's called Little River, because that was the river. Um, and and the first thing I wrote was her leaving this sweater, you know, that like she has all these feelings about, and she's not really like, you know, even even later knowing that that sweater is Maddie is once I figured out that whole puzzle, like she's not totally admitting to herself that she's leaving Maddie's sweater, but she's leaving Maddie's sweater, you know, like she's leaving it because she just saw Maddie and he didn't give her what you know what she needed from him and she realizes that's kind of gone for her and so um she's leaving that sweater behind she's not going to carry that anymore 
And so I really was playing with like what you leave and what you take. And, you know, another reason that the, the title became so, so appropriate um, is that that's kind of where it started is, is this idea of what you keep and what you leave when you pass by. You can like see in the book, there's, there's times where April takes things and leaves things like quite a bit. Like she takes a roll of quarters and leaves a shirt. She takes stuff from the campground and, you know, leaves some things behind and, um, so, so that was kind of just a theme I was playing with in general. Um, but also, you know, I think like there's a transience in your life as a teenager sometimes, you know, there's um, one of the reasons that I wanted to set it in the 90s was that when we left people, we left them, you know, like you left someone and, and you didn't know if you were going to see them again, even if you had an address, people move and then you lose touch with them, like people moved and didn't bring their phone numbers with them you know so it was just like anytime you said a goodbye you didn't know if it was a forever goodbye um mm -hmm. and I think that that raised the stakes on things um but I think that April you know April's whole thing is as a person who wasn't cared for enough who didn't really feel like she belonged it affected her self-esteem to the fact that she she wasn't sure she was going to be a person that could be good for anybody and um and she didn't want to hurt anyone the way that she'd been hurt so it it made her more transient um you know i i i enjoyed writing the relationship with adam i mean enjoyed is a hard word it was it was so heartbreaking to me because he was kind to her but there's so many gray areas in that situation like you know the gray area you kind of focus on is the fact that she is actually 16 yes. not 19 but the other gray area about that is that even if she were 19 she's a homeless girl who needs a place to stay and he's giving that to her and how even though he was kind to her how does that affect what does that mean in terms of consent really you know like what does that mean in terms of like wanting versus need and you know how would that relationship like you can romanticize a relationship but how would that have actually played out if she had stayed too you know, um, but the more losses that she acc accrues, like the harder I think it becomes for her to stay in one place because she she takes them on herself as like a measure of her personhood. Right, right. Um, how did the music became, you just mentioned the, you know, Bob Dylan song and kind of gave you a little bit of it. How did the music became part of this book and, I don't know, but uh, the last song that which was unfinished and she ends up finishing, um, where are you gonna stay? Do can you just write the lyric or do you do you have a tune for any of the song in your head that you can sing for us? Um, I do have <laughs> one of the songs that was written. This book is not is not true in any way, shape, or form. But the only thing um, I didn't grow up in a motorhome. I have never stolen a car. Um, but one of the things that that was kind of taken from my life a little bit is that um, I did, it was, I was the, the Town Crier Cafe that was in Pauling. It used to be in Pauling, New York. I think it moved. Um, but I, I went there with my guitar to an open mic night uh, after I dropped out of college and I had a song that I'd written and I went and played it. And I'd never been to an open mic before. I think that's actually kind of like a historic folk like Pete Seeger has has played at town crier kind of place and um i just walked in with my little guitar and was like like what do i do now um and and had somebody who performed ahead of me i actually like no i i figured out who she became later and she was incredible and i mean she was beautiful in all ways but um the guy sitting next to me who i didn't know uh kind of told me i had a chance of making it and i could kind of see through him but also liked the compliment and so I started playing with that with April in terms of her 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 performance, and so the song that she writes after she leaves the sweater, like or in the moment, like after she sees Maddie and she writes the song, is actually a, that that's the song I played at the open mic night that I went to, um, and I gave that to April because it fit because I was trying to write all these lyrics and then I got to that point and needed a song and I was like, oh wait, this. I, maybe I started writing this book in uh, <laughs> in 1997 um, with that song. Yeah, earlier. It, yeah, yeah, it just fit. But otherwise, the songs that are in there, um, the last song that she writes in the end, when I was still living in Rochester, I had um, 
chalkboard paint on my closet door in my office. And I was playing with those words for like a year, I think. I had it written out and I would just come and like erase a word and put a new word in and then change it back and take pictures of the whole thing on my phone. And I have all the like, so I really played with that for a very long time, but there isn't, there isn't music to it. Um, one of my friends a while ago wrote some, some music to, uh, to one of the songs that like the song that April sings when she's up in the moon with Ethan at the stage. Uh, but otherwise it's just, they're just lyrics and I don't actually have um, songs that go with them. I was so heavily influenced by music while I was writing it though. Um, I, I can picture everything that happens in the book in my mind, like a movie. And then my writing process is actually trying to like describe what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. And so music is a really, like the same way that, you know, if you have a big, like the same way that like, if you heard the heart, my heart will go on, you'll think of the Titanic. Like I can have certain songs for certain moments and play them. And then I'm back in that scene where I can go back to describing it better. And maybe I can see a little more clearly and, um, and it's helpful. So that was a big part of it. But the part that I think the, the most important musical influence on this, which you'll see the lyrics at the beginning of the book. It's um, from a song called Compass Rose by Chris Perica. When I was really struggling with um, whether I should change this book to fit in a box and try to sell another book, uh, I I was really struggling with that. Like I, I kind of felt like, why can't I just do the thing everybody wants me to do? Like, why can't I just be that writer? And I felt like maybe I wasn't being professional. And I got upset with, I got obsessed with the, with the song Compass Rose. The, it's beautiful. It talks about, uh, Chris is a really amazing writer and it talks about like different life stages and, you know, like the stage of searching. And then it talks like at the end about the stage of like sitting on a porch in a rocking chair and like thinking about your life and wearing, wearing the porch boards thin. And, um, but the middle part talks about like, I know someday I'll offer up a song I was made to play. And, um, and even the mockingbirds won't know what to say. I get like emotional when I think about it. Um, and I realized like, as I was listening to that song and getting obsessed with those words, that that's my book, like, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so I needed to write this book because that's, that's how important it was. And yeah. so because of that, I fought for this book, like because of Chris's song, I was like, if this is the book I was made to write, I can't compromise on it. And I got to the point where I, I fired my fourth agent and thought, who's going to write this for me? Like, I just need to know that I did it my way and I finished it. And I scrubbed out any advice I'd ever taken that didn't feel right to me to make somebody else happy. And, um, and I thought, you know, like if my niece sees this book someday in a, like a printout of it and it's like, when did my aunt write this? I'd be like, well, maybe she can publish it then, you know? Like, so I'm like in a nursing home and she's like, Aunt Al, what is this? Um, and I felt like that would be enough. And and so that was that was the last major draft of this book after 15 years was me just saying, April's mine, Margo's mine, Ethan's mine. And and then I found Deborah Schneider, who is the most amazing agent and she read it on an airplane and emailed me when she got off and said I need I need to do this and um she found Hannah Broughton who is the most incredible editor I could possibly imagine and then everyone at gallery like we we just all had the same vision mm -hmm. and so I finally have a book cover that matches the way I saw the book in my head and and I have a title that I love and um, and I got to work with people where like anytime the book does well, I'm so excited that they're succeeding too, you know, like this is this team project and I, I love these people so much and um, I'm going to do another book with them soon. So I'm, I'm excited about that too. Yeah, no, it's definitely, uh, this is, I, I love this book. So thank you for thank you. writing the way you wrote. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Going back to the, the question I just said that she's leaving behind the people that uh, actually is being nice to her. But then I was kind of taken back when she um, goes back to Justin, 
the person yeah. who did not treat her well uh, and kind of, you know, so-called used her for her, his adventure and his journey and then, le uh, you know, left because and then mistreated her and she still decided to go tell him that this is your baby. Why, uh, uh, why do you think she did that? I think that was actually like as much as she's going back to this person who was, you know, I mean, he, the thing about Justin is he's just kind of, uh, you know, like he's not a bad person. He's just not a good person. You know, like he's not spectacular and he's a kid and he's really spoiled and maybe he'll be a better person in the future. You know, like um, he doesn't know what he doesn't know and he's very sheltered. But um, for me, I saw that as the moment where April was suddenly going to try to do everything right instead of, um, you know, instead of like just running, she was actually gonna face, like she was gonna face her actions. You know, she was gonna face the results of her actions. She was gonna try to like um, not lie about things anymore. You know, she wasn't gonna cover up what the truth was. And the truth was that, he, you know, it was Justin's baby. So she was gonna go tell him. And I think she kind of hoped that that would be have the ending the way that you just like hope things are easy when they're hard you know like you hope there's like a magic answer but I think that was the moment where she was like I can't I can't keep leaving I can't keep you know getting caught up in lies I really have to figure out what I'm going to do for this kid and um you know Justin would have been a resource for help and I think she knew that like if he was going to help yeah. you know it would have been helpful but I think she also didn't want to um it wasn't like she was going to try to take advantage of the situation she was just like I gotta figure out what's best for my kid here and maybe this is maybe this could be it yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting um do you have any um hold on. do you think because uh the way in the last chapter after she finds it was sad. I actually also uh, cried when I she's trying hard to get back to uh, see uh, her dying father and she doesn't make it. Um, yeah. And then I, I do feel like in the last few chapters, she's seeing like she's trying to forgive Irene and trying to forgive, uh, see that it was not her, it was her father because Margot kind of tells her. So do you think that she, uh, and also uh, she also talks about that her, this is how probably her mother felt why she left. Um, so do you think she actually at the end kind of probably for, for gave her parents or got closure um, with what happened with her life or? I think, I think it is kind of, um, you know, the realization that they they were just doing the best that they could and it wasn't good enough, you know, like, and and she wasn't, she couldn't, I think the big thing for April is this idea that like she couldn't have been something different and gotten a different result because Irene didn't either, you know, like, I, I think, um, I actually, I like, I have a lot of empathy for April's dad too, you know, like I, I kind of, you kind of have to have empathy for all these characters because I think that like, it couldn't have felt good to be him. And he was just trying to like, you know, I think like his, his going towards Irene was just a situation of like, he hadn't made mistakes with her yet. You know, like maybe he could start fresh, maybe like, and um, so I think, I, I think it's just April moving on. I think it's just April being free to love the people who can love her back the way she needs to be loved. Um, I think that's kind of the realization and having the question answered of why uh, why Margot didn't take her in, I think was kind of the big the big epiphany for her that it wasn't it wasn't that Margot didn't want her. It wasn't that like there was a line in their relationship that Margot had created. It was that Margot was like trying to do the best that she could too. And, um, you know, and, and that Margot wanted her. And if Margot wanted her, then, you know, Margot wants her baby too. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, last few chapters, I don't know why I cried, but I sure did. I, because I, <laughs> oh, I, I cried first, writing it. <laughs> <laughs> in the world of April. Um, do you have any uh, upcoming uh, projects? Anything in pipeline? announced i have a book coming out hopefully in 2023 um about 
a young woman who inherits a house and finds out that her niece has been living there. So it's it's an older character. I'm actually writing um, my main character isn't like just about to, like just turning 30, but there is also a teenager in the book too. So I feel like um, it was nice to kind of be able to, to, to get back to that too. And it's another book I've been writing for a really long time. Um, I, I think I started it maybe in 2012 or 2013. I had like two characters I was starting to play with and then it's evolved into like, they had a different story and then their story kind of evolved. And then um, I think it was in 2018, I, my husband was away for a weekend and I just put butcher paper on the walls and like colored my book. Like I just like got crayons and wrote this outline and drew pictures and I've sort of been piecing the book together in little bits alongside everything else ever since. So um, it's another example of like not writing in order. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, can't wait for your next book. So, thank you good. and again congratulations for this book um, oh, thank you yeah i now i wanted to open it up uh, for our patrons and see if anybody from the crowd has any questions um let's see you gallery all right uh kathy all right let's see i'm gonna unmute you